All right. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the very first session of Room for Discussion in this new academic year. Um, a special welcome also to all the first year students that are here. Great that you're here. Um, we have a very special interview planned for you today. Um, that's because we have two very influential economists here with us, uh, Mr. Kaushik Basu and Mr. Ballard. Uh, Mr. Ballard is currently the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, uh, one of the 12 regional uh, Federal Reserve Banks that make up the, uh, the Fed as a national whole. And um, he is here in the Netherlands to talk about adaptive learning models at the conference of the University of Amsterdam uh, and the Nederlandse Bank, the Dutch Central Bank. Um, next to him will be Mr. Kaushik Basu. He is currently the chief economist of the World Bank and previously served as an uh, economic advisor to the, um, I'm sorry, uh, to the government of India. Um, today we will be discussing policy making of both the World Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank and we will then move onwards to uh, rational models, which we will be discussing. I don't know what this exactly is. I'm sorry. Um, we will be discussing those models, which models will we will be using. Will we see a shift coming up uh, in the near future towards uh, models that are maybe less based on the homo economicus, the very rational uh, behavior of people. And we will finally uh, discuss, and that's the main topic of this interview, austerity. Uh, just a quick uh, a reminder to you of what austerity actually is. It's the cutting in uh, government spending in order to reduce the co uh, government deficit um, and therefore uh, reduce the uh, government debt. So that's what we will be discussing today. Uh, before I give a, a warm hand, uh, we give a warm hand to both gentlemen. Please be aware that you can question, ask your questions uh, over there, uh, Isabel. Um, and that you can join the discussion at Twitter using hashtag RFD. Right. Without further ado, please give a warm hand to both gentlemen, Mr. James Ballard and Mr. Kaushik Basu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Ballard and Mr. Basu. It's great having you here today. We've been looking forward to the session for quite a while now, so uh, for the whole summer, actually. So good to have you. Diving straight in with you, Mr. Bullard, you're one of the 12 presidents of the regional Federal Reserve Banks of the U.S. How does the Federal Reserve of St. Louis fit within the Federal Reserve in the U.S. as a whole, nationally and internationally? Uh, well, the Federal Reserve is the central bank of the U.S. There are uh, seven governors in Washington, uh, only five of which are f uh, filled right now, uh, uh, our esteemed chair is uh, Janet Yellen, the first female chair ever of the Federal Reserve, uh, and she's doing a great job. And, and then we have the 12 banks that are around the country, which are trying to get input from uh, around the USA about how the economy is operating, and we try to feed into monetary policy through that process. Mm -hmm. So the, the regional banks, they aggregate data, and together you discuss on the policies in the Federal Open Market Committee? That's correct. Uh, the main policy-making arm of the Federal Reserve is the Federal Open Market Committee, and it consists of the governors plus the 12 uh, uh, bank heads. So it's a, it's a pretty big committee. It takes a long time to actually go around the table and uh, have everybody give their input. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, um, Mr. Basu, coming to you. Uh, you're the chief economist of the World Bank. Uh, the World Bank, we know, is an organization to reduce poverty throughout the world. How does your role as a chief economist fit into such an ins institution? Uh, the World Bank has uh, broadly two different functions. One is uh, lending money exactly. to developing and emerging economies, but it does that with a lot of uh, presence in the knowledge sector, research and ideas. And the poverty reduction that you mentioned, the World Bank works with two mission goals. One of them is the end of poverty. Uh, poverty is defined in a very specific way over there. $1.90 of income per person per day. If you're below that, you're considered poor. That population, we have policies targeted for that. The second goal of the World Bank, which is relatively new, we adopted this three years ago, is to promote shared prosperity. Right. And the way that is defined is, to promote the growth rate of income of the bottom 40% of every society to pay special attention to that group 
So that's more to do with inequality, blended with growth is what that is about. The first one is about poverty. And as chief economist, uh, my, my main job is really in this knowledge sector. So the World Bank has very big divisions of researchers, of data collectors, people who are collecting data, analyzing them. Then there is another division, which is a forecasting. They are doing global forecasting of different countries, uh, emerging economies in particular, right. with a lot of attention. So all that is overseen by the chief economist. And we produce a couple of very, very important documents, which are receive a lot of global attention. These are called the flagship publications of the World Bank. There are four of those. World Bank brings out lots of things, but four are considered flagship publications. All that is under the charge of the chief economist. So that's right. roughly what I okay. do. Mm -hmm. So mainly uh, research into the, actually the, the entire world, basically, on, on trying to gain prosperity, again, back in inequality. Yes, that is there. And I have to say that uh, I wear another hat, which is a senior vice president of the World Bank. Exactly. And that with the uh, World Bank president is a small group called the senior management team, which looks overall at the World Bank's strategic en engagement with the world and other kinds of things. So right. both these things are a part of my work. Okay. So and, and why are you here in the Netherlands today? What, what kind of role are you playing well, now? Well, uh, yeah, uh, th this is a very, very uh, non-lending your intellectual engagement okay. presence in the Netherlands. I was in uh, the Hague at the Hague yesterday. Right. I entered actually through the Hague, had uh, meetings with uh, your parliamentarians. The Council of State, which is an advisory uh, body, had meetings with them. This morning uh, with PricewaterhouseCoopers, I was with uh, basically the corporate sector and corporate heads in another round of discussion now with the university and a few more such, it's a two-day visit. What were you discussing at the, at the uh, Prince Waterhouse Cooper? What was the discussion about there? Uh, it was uh, the current global challenge, so it was uh, over a range of things, right from a little bit to do with global policy coordination, monetary policy, which is uh, his specialization. I was <laughs> dabbling in that a little bit, but also going into the labor challenge. In the world today, there is a Possibly, and I do take a position that there is a declining demand for labor, which data is showing, which is taking the form of from political turmoil to conflict of different kinds, where beneath that is this labor market changing structure. So a lot of the discussion was the long run impact and implications of that. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And you, Mr. Ballard, we know you came here for the conference of the U University of Amsterdam and the, the Nederlandse Bank, the Dutch Central Bank, on... Um, the adaptive learning models, which will be the main theme of the conference. Could you give us a quick overview, because we'll be discussing this in more detail later on, but what's the difference between the more rational models and adaptive learning models that you are, will be discussing at the conference? Yeah, my research is on uh, lear so-called learning in macroeconomics. So this means that uh, if you're not familiar with it, you know, in macroeconomics, expectations of the future are very important for what happens today. And the typical way this is done is you have the so-called rational expectations. Uh, and what, what the literature that I'm involved in uh, does is try to back off that assumption because it's a very strong assumption and try to see if uh, what kinds of other results you might get out of the models if you, if you don't make such a strong assumption about the rationality of the people in the model. Uh, so it's, it's a bit esoteric, but frankly, I think it also has important policy implica implications. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we'll uh, be dedicating quite a, yeah, a good 10, 10, 15 minutes on this, but good, good to hear. I mean, it's uh, yeah, an interesting topic. I think for now it would be good. Uh, we'll be discussing the models and uh, also austerity later on in the interview, as Elias mentioned. For now, I think it would be nice to do a bit more on the policy making of the World Bank and the Federal Reserve. So we know one of the, the World Bank advices on policies in middle and low income countries. Could you give us some examples of what kind of policies these are? So um, the primary focus of our policy engagement is, you're quite right, uh, middle-income, uh, low-income <coughs> countries, emerging economies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a whole range of that that we look at. But usually, if you are thinking of a separation between the IMF and us, we have a lot of overlapping interests. I work very closely with the chief economist of the IMF. Mm -hmm. But if it's a sudden financial type crisis, a balance of payments crisis, it is the IMF that gets engaged, mm -hmm. whereas the long-term developmental challenges is where we are much more engaged in different countries. 
So from areas like building infrastructure, uh, investment in health and education, mm -hmm. uh, these are the kinds of areas where we try to bring in the best, best expertise and be engaged with it. We are now increasingly involved also in environmental challenge, which earlier actually we were not so prominently in there, but we want to be engaged with developing countries so that they very early begin to take steps towards that. Mm -hmm. Having said this, with even richer countries, we are engaged, uh, not by actually lending money, but engaged in some of their policy challenges. With my counterpart in the IMF, we would have discussions that when richer countries face problems of sudden downturns, and especially if they are of a developmental nature, it sort of falls through the crack of IMF not paying enough attention, we don't pay enough attention, but we are actually engaged in some of them. Broad business ethos. How do you run businesses better? World Bank has a very famous report, very controversial, but very famous report called Ease of Doing Business. This has us engaged all over the world with 189 countries. Mm -hmm. We look into their structure. So yes, our primary focus is what, what developing countries. What does the report say? What does the report, the, the controversial report The report, report in the end comes out with a ranking of countries as to in which countries is it easiest to do business for and by business, we mean small businesses, okay. to start up a business, to close down a business. If you have a contract, how quickly is the contract enforced? Having a good business ethos, an efficient one, you need, re modern world needs regulation. But if it's an efficient regulation system, it allows the country to do better. So we do this comparison across countries. And as you will expect, any exercise where you end up with a ranking Every time you publish that, your phone begins to ring <laughs> because every second person is objecting to where they have arrived. Yeah. So it takes up a disproportionate amount of my time managing this particular product. Okay, <laughs> that's very clear. Um, but, and how do the, um, the countries that receive loans from you, what, gui what sort of guidelines do they have to stick to in order to get those loans? What do you get in return? Uh, we actually, uh, uh, it sounds uh, uh, like a missionary exercise, yeah. but <laughs> we really the aim is not to get anything out of uh, in return. No, from no, no, these not countries. for the World Bank, but for themselves. For, for the countries yeah. themselves. Yeah, exactly. The World Bank, it is a bit of a yeah engagement in their interest. Yeah. The hope is to get these countries back again, developing and growing rapidly. And as we said, that our mission goal <coughs> is to focus on poverty in those countries and shared prosperity, so the bottom 40% of the population. Yeah. You know, focusing on this, the poverty line that we draw that I mentioned just yeah. now, $1.90, there are many civil society activists who will come and get very upset. $1.90 per day is shockingly low. So they will say that, look, I mean, it's insulting to draw a line that low. But to me, what is more insulting is in the world today, there are roughly 800 million people below, below that below. shockingly low line. Mm -hmm. So our engagement with different countries is to focus on that and say these are the policies which are good for this segment of the population. Having said this, just one word, in economics is a fluid science. I mean, we don't have sure answers. So you need a bit of modesty to say that this is our best ideas. Some of them may be wrong. So we are continuously engaged intellectually, re-evaluating our own policy advice as well. Mm -hmm. And do, do you notice there's a sort of best practice framework that you can apply for these loans and in order to better these, uh, the countries and the poverty? Or is it a sort of individual case, one by one? Is there overlap? It, there is an overlap of both. There, there are some best practices. Doing business is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. We take certain general rules which we think are good for every uh, society to have an efficient business ethos. Same rules being applied to exactly 189 countries, the same uh, criterion. When we do that, we are a bit self-conscious that there are areas where there are important differences in countries. So when we are going in with our loan, we actually sit with that country. And a lot of it is a country-specific advice. And off late, the World Bank has entered a new arena, which is looking into human psychology, which was earlier something we did not go into. But behavioral economics has been brought in very centrally into the World Bank, being fully aware that from okay. one society to another, there are cultural differences, social norm differences. Earlier, the World Bank was very insensitive to that. Mm -hmm. And then you make big mistakes. Mm -hmm. But our aim is, starting with this report that we have produced called Mind, Society and Behavior, 
to also begin to delve into these societal differences in devising policy. Yeah, let, let, let's hear more of that in, a, in the later, in the third mm -hmm. stage of the rational models and the different models. Yeah. Uh, very, very, relevant. very interesting, mm -hmm. very relevant, how the World Bank has seen a shift in yeah. that. Uh, coming to you, Mr. Mr. Ballard, um, the, uh, could you explain to us the, the role of the Fed in monetary policy and especially the role of quantitative easing um, as opposed to normal interest rate adjustments? How is it? What is the difference between QE and between normal interest rate reduces or increases? What is the difference? Right, so the, uh, the Open Market Committee has uh, a policy instrument, which is a very short-term interest rate. And uh, when the crisis came uh, in 2008, uh, we lowered the policy rate uh, very close to zero. So the so-called zero lower bound, if for those of you that don't follow, uh, monetary policy. So that's why interest rates uh, have been extremely low ever since then, uh, ever since 2008. Um, and then the question was, well, if you've already uh, lowered interest rates as much as you can, what else could you do to uh, help the economy recover from the, uh, the big crisis? And the answer uh, was, or uh, controversially within monetary economics, was to say, okay, we're going to buy bonds longer term uh, uh, treasury securities in the US. So what that's supposed to do is drive down longer term interest rates, not just the short term interest rates, but the longer term interest rates as well. And the longer term interest rates are thought to be more important for people that are buying houses or cars or trying yeah. to finance things. Uh, it's, very, it's pretty controversial when you get into it inside economics, but I think the basic picture is that it's been successful uh, in the U.S., uh, we did get unemployment down from 10 percent to now under 5 yeah. percent. So it has uh, <coughs> the U.S. economy has largely recovered, and uh, uh, so I think the QE programs were probably pretty successful on the whole. But it'll be debated out for many years okay, in the yeah. economics and world. Yeah. So you could say that the QE is more long-term based, and interest just. Short Longer term interest, interest rates, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, but they also buy up the bad debts of the banks, right? Not only you, you mentioned treasury. No, that's a, uh, that's a misnomer. So if you think we're buying up bad debt, <laughs> get that thought right out of your okay. head. That's something my mother would say. But uh, uh, you, the, the Fed did not come in and buy up uh, uh, bad debt. We actually only bought newly issued high quality debt after the crisis. Okay. So it was really more an interest, it was a story about uh, what can we do with interest rate policy at longer term interest rates. But in order as well to liquidate the banks and maybe for them to be more liquid and, and therefore be able to loan out to uh, the consumers, right? In order to uh, stimulate well, the economy. Well, uh, on the banking side, we also have a regulatory uh, role to play. And the, the main thing that happened in the U.S. after the crisis was the so-called Dodd-Frank Act, yeah. which was a big bill passed by the Congress and, and signed by the president, which put new regulations on banks. And we're trying to implement that. In fact, it's not completely implemented even today, uh, but we're trying to implement that. That has many things in it, but mostly higher capital requirements uh, for banks. So they have to, they can make loans and everything, but they have to hold more capital, capital in case something goes wrong so that taxpayers wouldn't be on the hook in the future. Yeah. Okay, and then coming to the uh, inevitable question, so to say, the interest rate uh, increasement of the in the U.S., um, you just had the, the meeting with all the Fed members uh, and the FOMC. Um, do you see the interest rates going up this year, or maybe even this month, September? Well, uh, I th you know, Chair Yellen gave a gave a speech recently, and I, I think the the basic takeaway is we'd like to keep our options open. Yeah. Um, I don't think if some of you that are familiar with my policy position is that uh, I don't think interest rates are going to rise very much in the U.S. even over the next two to two and a half years. Uh, you can read all about it if you go to our web page. Yeah, you, you, you said yeah. personally that you would only see one interest rate increase until 2018, right? That's right. As so we think we're in an environment that is characterized by uh, lower growth in the U.S. than what we're used to, yeah. maybe only 2%. Um, we think the labor markets have recovered, but we don't really expect much change there now going forward. So we'll stay at an unemployment rate below 5%. And then inflation in the U.S. is actually quite low. Uh, 
depends how, exactly how you want to measure it, but I think a number to keep in your head is maybe 1.6%, 1.7%, somewhere in there, a little bit below 2%. So because of that, with that configuration of data and not too much changing anytime soon, uh, we just think we can go ahead mostly with the interest rates that we have for now and uh, wait and we'll see if, if something big happens, then we'll have to react to that. But, but for now, projecting out into the future, I don't see a lot of rate increases. Okay, but if, if employment, I mean, you mentioned uh, in an interview at Bloomberg, I believe that it's beyond full employment, meaning that many people are employed, I mean, a certain maximum has been reached. Based on that, you could say that there could be an interest rate increase, right? I mean, Ms. Mrs. Jelen well seems to put a lot of emphasis on the, the labor uh, output that she gets. That's true, but unemployment in the U.S. is uh, in the high 4% okay. range. Most people think that that's kind of full employment on, on a U.S. Uh, scale. And uh, we're not saying that, that it that's good. So we want to be there. But we just don't see anything changing uh, anytime soon. In right. the last expansion in the 2000s, unemployment got down to 4.7%, uh, 4.6%. 4 and it just stayed there for the last two years before the crisis came. So we think a good prediction for the next couple of years is just that we'll stay in this mode until something big happens. Okay, and so, we'll so see waiting that. till something big happens and then we'll might increase it or even decrease it. Or, or decrease it, yeah, yeah okay. that's right. Yeah. Clear. Uh, bringing back the models that we had discussed a bit earlier, you seem to have a bit of more of a prudent stance towards some of your colleagues. Could this be because you analyze the data based on different models than your counterparts, more in the discussion of rational versus more behavioral, that you get your conclusion from? Yeah, uh, let me just give an example about how uh, uh, these expectations really matter in macro models. So the typical thing that we've studied uh, historically in the U.S. is the idea that you'd have, a, 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 you know, an interest rate, a nominal interest rate that would be around 4 or 5% or something like that, and that would kind of be normal times. And then uh, you'd have full employment and you'd grow and you'd go along uh, at, this, at this normal uh, state. Now, there are models that say that, well, wait a minute, there's another possible outcome, and the other possible outcome is that interest rates would be extremely low, uh, close to zero, and that uh, inflation would also be extremely low. Mm -hmm. You think about that for a minute, you look around the world, that sounds like Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Short-term interest rates in Japan have not been above 50 basis points uh, in the last 20 years, and inflation has consistently been extremely low. So if you have this idea in your head that normal interest rates are 4 or 5% or something, and you've got a major economy, yeah. which is, a, Japan is a major economy, mm -hmm. and they never have had that for the last 20 years, that makes you kind of rethink mm -hmm. your Those model. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have the right concept of normal uh, in our model? So in this, in this literature that I work in about adaptive expectations and learning, uh, you can get that low outcome, that low nominal interest rate, low inflation right. outcome, mm -hmm. And so it might tie in with reality better, and then you can think about, well, what are the policy implications of that? How should we be conducting monetary policy in that world, the Japanese world, as opposed to the kind of world that we have in our head, which is U.S. 1980s, 1990s, yeah, or Europe 1980s, 1990s? Okay. Um, before we jump into the, the models that we already previously uh, gave a short preview of and, and just yet as well, are there any questions from the audience in regards to the policies of both the Fed or the World Bank? Um, is it those over there? Any qu yeah, I see a question over there. A few. To either of the both gentlemen, yeah. please address. Hi. Um, yeah, so with regard to the QE program, um, Mr. Ballard, you told us that uh, there's been a purchase of um, high quality assets. Uh, and so far, if I'm correct, this, this QE stock has been man maintained in the sense that uh, maturing assets are being re reinvested. Um, would you say that this stock uh, is likely to decrease uh, in time, in short term? Or? Excellent question. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet before the crisis was uh, about $800 million. Today, it's over $4 trillion. So uh, because of all these purchases, the balance sheet went way up. Yep. 
And what the committee has said about this is that eventually we want to bring the balance sheet back down to a more normal size, but we don't want to start doing that until we get further along in the normalization process, which means further along in the interest rate process. So I just told you that I'm not really seeing much happening on interest rates, so that by implication that would mean maybe not too much is going to happen with the balance sheet either yeah. uh, anytime soon. Uh, so that's kind of where we are right now. The committee has pushed this decision off into the future. Any questions to Mr. Kaushik Basu on the World Bank? Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm from South Africa, um, and so I do quite a lot of research on uh, African development and structural adjustment um, and that sort of aspect of the World Bank. Uh, so I just, I'd love to hear from you from an economic perspective. How um, has the World Bank after seeing the failure of structural adjustments and the failure of like these neoclassical models, how is the World ba Bank actively trying to change their approaches um, considering the power dynamics uh, when you interact with those developing states? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the neoclassical model is such a broad brush description of a whole lot of things. Uh, some parts of it, it is true that through the experience we learned, and I learned it for quite some time, do not work. And some of those, we are going to come back later when we discuss rationality, yeah. I will come back into some of those, which is our understanding of that. But there are also parts of the neoclassical model, since it's a really a very big structure which goes back to research which was in the, uh, uh, from the 19th century, parts of it that, which are still relevant and ought to be used. But the way I view it as the changing view of the world is, some of those pieces of advice to do with macro probity and things like that remain in place. I personally believe also that openness to prevent protectionism is good advice and we should stay with that. But there are also some parts which have failed and there is a stock taking going on. But the stock taking has to do with rather deep corrections. I mean, if you take Africa today, Africa has a bigger range of performance than virtually anywhere else in the world. There are some countries in Africa which are growing at about 10% per annum. Ethiopia is a good example. Rwanda is close to that. There are some parts that are actually collapsing by 10% per annum. Huge divergence of uh, behavior. And you realize that a part of this is to do with economic policy, but a part of it is also social and political elements come in. So it's more than just a critique of neoclassical economics. It's the importance of bringing in some understandings of social norms, some understanding of politics and how that impinges on economic functioning. And we are engaged in both of those. And I'm hoping that later on, we will be able to come back into some of those issues. Definitely. Definitely. Um, we're actually coming to it right now um, <laughs> with you, uh, Mr. Ballard. Um, you already mentioned that you were on the other side, basically, more on looking at the longer term. Uh, Japan is a prime example of, of our rational models not uh, usable anymore. Why do you think that so many of your economic colleagues still are on that rational side, still believe in those textbook economics, so to say? Well, uh, I agree with this comment that the uh, you're talking about neoclassical economics, it's something that's like yeah. this big. Uh, all kinds of people, smart people, have worked on this over a long period of time. So there are many pieces that, uh, that are just have become standard and you wouldn't wanna, uh, you wouldn't wanna throw out the good parts uh, with the parts that aren't working. Um, the, you know, the part that I'm talking about is really the expectations of the future which are critically important to how macroeconomic models work. Businesses are very concerned about what they see in the future. Households are very concerned about what they see in the future. If they don't see good things coming in the future, they will change their behavior right now. And so this, this has, a, has a big impact. And if you do, the, you do the rational expectations thing, everyone thinks that something's gonna happen in the future and they're all right. They all get it exactly right. But that isn't what happens no, uh, in the real world. And that has big implications for, like, you know, real people, how they're, how they're really uh, behaving. You think of a business, 
in the U.S. that's thinking about a billion dollar investment somewhere and uh, they're kind of scratching their heads. What's the future tax environment going to be? What's the future monetary policy going to be? You know, what's the political environment going to be? They're thinking about all these things when they're making that investment and then, you know, to get them to go and go ahead and make that investment, they have to, they have to be very confident in the future. Okay. Um, and Mr. Basu, you already mentioned that you were able, or at least trying to incorporate other factors into our models as well, uh, behavior of people. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? I mean, isn't it very difficult to incorporate irrationality or cultural differences into our economics? How, would you, how do you see that? It's not as difficult as seems at first sight. Okay. One of the reasons is, as I think it was just mentioned, yeah that the traditional economics was uh, founded on many things, but one of them was the assumption of individual selfish rationality. I'm just doing max maximization for myself. That was so deeply embedded in economics that trying to break away from that immediately causes some problems. But look at it in the following fashion, that human irrationalities, some of them are actually systematic irrationalities. All of us have different measures of that. Those are possible to bring into the model of analysis. And also there are certain parts which are to do with social norms, which even if they differ across societies, we can study and get to understand them. Yeah. I'll give you two examples which mm -hmm. pull the World Bank into this kind of research. One is my own interest. If you in the olden days when I was a student in London, went around and asked economists, why don't people pick other people's wallets, pickpockets in traveling in buses or sitting in a group like that? Why don't people steal other people's wallets? The answer by economists would be given in terms of pure rational calculation. People don't steal other people's pockets because if you take away another person's wallet, you may get $100, $200, but you can get caught and then you'll be punished $2,000. And that cost is no, not the reason why you don't pick other people's pockets. Right. But that was, to me, a brainwashing of economics. Just think <laughs> for a moment. If that's the reason why we don't steal other people's wallets, then sitting in a room like this, you'll feel very uncomfortable <laughs> if you know everyone is calculating <laughs> whether it's worthwhile stealing your wallet or not. We feel comfortable because we know that in most places, most societies, we don't even go through that calculation. Mm -hmm. Human beings have norms of that kind all over in life, and we've made too little room for that. When in the World Bank, we for the first time started discussing that we should bring in these non-rational, behavioral, psychology-based analysis into the modeling, there was a lot of criticism that, look, is this really a domain where economists should go in? To that, again, my response was with an example. The private sector already makes use of individual irrationalities in a huge way. Yeah. And given that they are doing that for the development set, for government, for central banks, yeah. to understand human systematic irrationalities is important. And the specific example which I used, which you will get it in the United States very often, and maybe even in the Netherlands. Suppose you're going to buy a refrigerator and you go to a shop which sells only refrigerators. Often in the United States, when entering the shop, you'll see one refrigerator, which is fantastic, exactly what you wanted every facility, but very high price. You stand there and you wonder whether such a high priced refrigerator is worth buying. People typically will not buy. In fact, if you check with the store, you will discover that that refrigerator, that kind of refrigerator is never sold. Why do they have the refrigerator over there in front of the store? Because after you look at it and you go in, your pricing mechanism in your head gets changed. Then you'll buy another very expensive refrigerator because your price reference has been changed. Private sector uses these kinds of techniques all the time, giving mortgages you use that. We should use that for development purposes, for good purposes, for getting people to take education, for getting people to buy health support. So that was the idea with which we produced this report called Mind, Society, and Behavior, mm -hmm. which is really quite a move away from very traditional economics. But after we produced the report, the buy-in has been huge, and it's been very satisfying to have, have produced that. OK, maybe, maybe another example, because pickpocketing and buying refrigerators um, isn't really a policy that the uh, um, World Bank 
is engaged in. So yeah. what healthcare, you mentioned healthcare, yeah. how would it look like uh, healthcare? How would you incorporate those factors of irrationality or different yeah. social norms? I can give you one from your country. Okay, please. Um, um, giving your body parts in the event of a sudden death. If you have an accident, whether you want to uh, sign off to give your body parts or not, if you look at European countries, you see huge differences. For instance, in the Netherlands, I know it's 27% um, people uh, sign up for giving up their body parts in the event of an accident. You can take away. Uh, in Belgium, right next door, 98% people give away. In Germany, only 15% people give away. In Austria, it's 99 point some percent people give away. Is it these huge differences? In people, the answer is no. It's one element of economics that we do wrong. In economics, we assume that whenever you give a person a choice between A and B, people will rationally calculate and choose whatever is better for them. But the default action is extremely important. So if you tell people, I'm giving you a choice of between A and B, but if you say nothing, we'll assume it's A. Or if you say nothing, we'll assume it's B. You can get dramatically different behavior. In the Netherlands, the default option is you don't give your body parts. Exactly. And exactly. therefore, it appears that people don't want to give their body yeah. parts. In Belgium, the default, if you say nothing, is if you, you are giving away your body parts. So just how you give people the choice makes a big difference. And we know this from rural um, poor countries. Money lending, how you describe the interest rate whether you say you're giving an interest rate of 10% per month compound interest rate or 200% per annum, you will get people to make the wrong choice yeah. because 10% per month sounds very little, whereas 200% per annum sounds very big, but 10% per month compounded is more than 200% per annum. How you pose the choice, you can trick people one way or the other, and this is what we want to bring in in promoting better behavior, better kinds of choices in developing countries. It seems that this is quite a hot topic at the mm -hmm. moment from both of you, the whole behavioral side. And um, it's not particularly something new. We've seen it uh, in the 30s, 40s with Keynes. He uh, introduced the herding and um, these topics. So do you think we'll see a sudden shift towards these more rational models now? And why? Why all of a sudden now? Is it because we've seen the previous models fail or... M Mr. Ballard, maybe on, on yeah. fat level. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we see that the World Bank is uh, doing a lot of uh, new ways. Uh, how is it with the Fed? Do they also incorporate such factors, for instance? And do you see a shift coming in mm -hmm. the future? Well, uh, the Fed has um, a great deal of research going on at any one time. Uh, I'm one of the ones that's involved in uh, uh, sort of backing off of some of the rationality assumptions. So I think it is more popular uh, than it was. Uh, anytime you go on a research program, though, you can't just go just because you think it's uh, fun or something. You know, you gotta, you gotta show that you can do something better than the previous model, and you can explain data better than the previous model. Actually, we just heard some great examples, you know, right here. Uh, and so, and then you have to think about, well, how can that aggregate up and and change my policy from what it otherwise would have been? So I think there's, you know, a great deal more sympathy for this than there has been in the past. Uh, one other comment I would make is that a lot of what goes on in day-to-day -day monetary policy making is actually just forecasting uh, where you're going to be in the next six months. Uh, and so th those kinds of models um, are very statistically oriented. They're, they're just trying to extrapolate from immediate uh, past trends. So I, I don't think those kinds of models are being influenced uh, yeah. by this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this, it's, uh, you have to go to other types of uh, areas to see the influence. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I oh, want to uh, tell you about why earlier some of this awareness <coughs> did not impact and why I expect mm -hmm. to, that to impact. And one of the reasons, there were early thinkers, Thorstein Veblen, 100 yeah. years ago, yeah. Even Jan Tinbergen, these were people yeah. who were occasionally pointing out, yeah. Thorstein Veblen, of course, extensively, but Tinbergen occasionally, that rationality is not always the case. What has changed is the discovery of systematic irrationalities. People are short-sighted, hyperbolic discounting. These are things which are now 
being available through experiments and studies much more systematically. So though at one level we were aware for a long time, and sociologists and psychologists have been aware for a very long time, it, there is hope that today it's going to permeate more extensively because it's much more systematic research backing this up. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> um, I think it's time for audience questions on this part of, of <coughs> new models. Does anybody <coughs> have, have, have a, yeah, I see a que question over there. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you the ethics of the behavioral economics. Um, the positive effects of the nudging has been very well recognized, but there are some problems. For example, the other day I visited the city office, and there, for the first time, I discovered my personal civic data is by default available to all agencies and organizations that are authorized by the Dutch government, unless I object so. And I had no idea of this default setting. And if in the future, for example, applications like my medical details might become by default available to pharmaceutical companies and uh, government uh, policy makers, it could be a problem. So um, I would like to ask your view on the ethical uh, size of the uh, behavioral nudging. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe for you, Mr. I, I can uh, take a, you know, this risk that behaviorally you will manipulate individuals mm -hmm. against their interest and in your own interest is a risk as soon as you learn this kind of science, behavioral economic psychology, that risk is already there. And in fact, one of the lines that we took at the World Bank is this is already being used by the private sector, by politicians when they run for in elections, they use all kinds of psychological methods to appeal to individuals. So that risk is already there. It's being used by a whole class of operators. All we were doing is saying that now that this knowledge is available, let the people interested in development, let the people interested in certain important things of society also begin to use the knowledge which is available. The risk is there, and I'm glad that we are today openly discussing this because gradually with the risk, we will also put in place certain measures to ward off and guard that risk. There's no foolproof method, but we will move towards that. All right. Um, then coming to the, to the final part of the interview, austerity, um, and you already mentioned, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ballard, that people take into account what will be happening in the future. Uh, therefore, one of, one of the prime example or one of the prime arguments for austerity is that people think that after a recession, government debts have gone up, and therefore, if the uh, taxes stay low now, they will see an increase in taxes because they have to try to, uh, well, de decrease government debt again. Uh, seems to us a very rational, uh, um, rational, how to say, a, a rational thing to think that people will actually think three years ahead and expect a tax increase because the government will be decreasing uh, the, the debts of government. Um, how do you see that? Do you agree with us that austerity is a, a policy that is very much based on the rational models? Yeah, it's a classic result in macroeconomics with forward-lookingness that uh, uh, if you if you you know engage in deficit spending today, that people will see the taxes that are coming in the future, and then under certain assumptions, you wouldn't have any effect at all exactly. uh, through that process. Uh, one thing I'd like to see in the austerity debate is more focus on the composition of government spending. So if the spending that you're going to undertake is for public capital, and the public capital is going to be productive for the economy and have a high rate of return for the economy, then even with the rationality, people might see that as something that's going to improve macroeconomic outcomes in the future, and you might get good results from that kind of thing. So in the US, there's a big debate on crumbling infrastructure, not enough attention has been paid to uh, freeways and bridges. We had a bridge actually totally collapse in Minneapolis, my hometown. Uh, so uh, the idea is, well, maybe we should get a more comprehensive program to get that built up. Now that is public capital. The public capital might actually be productive for uh, total GDP and you might get higher GDP in the future, even though you are gonna have to pay the taxes for yeah. it you still get uh, good results. So I think maybe that's a better, a uh, little bit better way to think about how this, uh, 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 how a good government spending program can be structured and can operate. 
uh, as opposed to just any dollar of government spending. All right. What are your views on that, Mr. Mr. Basu? You seem to be that we should also incorporate microeconomics into the debate of austerity and stimulus. How would, it, how would that look like? How would we incorporate micro foundations into this debate? Uh, the micro foundation part uh, properly doing is actually a long-term research agenda because we know for people who are sort of mainstream economists that when it comes to the real economy, we have a pretty well-structured thinking, which is the works which started with Leon Walras a long time ago. But once you bring money into the picture uh, and want to understand the connection between money and the real world, that micro foundation of that is much more complicated and we will get just piecemeal views of this. But let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is very close to the same kinds of yeah. concerns yeah. where um, uh, Mr. Bullard has a much more detailed understanding than I have, but it still comes up. You know, um, in India, uh, there was a big effort to um, get people included in the financial system. One possible side effect of that, which was not being appreciated enough, lot of rural, in rural India, people keep, keep their money under the pillow and under the mattress because they don't have bank accounts, large population. Yep. The idea was that you help them to create bank accounts and put their money in, in the bank accounts. One of the possible consequences of that, which was not very prominent in the debate, it's almost like increasing money supply in the economy because money that was effectively withdrawn because it's kept in store, you're putting it back into circulation. And it's entirely possible that one round of inflation that was taking place in India was being caused by this, not the central bank doing anything, but ordinary people putting their money back into circulation by putting it in a bank. Because as soon as you're putting it into a bank, there's the money multiplier beginning to kick in. So micro-individual behavior can have lots of implications for the running of the macro economy. Yep. And this, we are aware of the importance of this link, but this Let's is a see. research agenda which is going to remain open with us for quite some time. And this is one agenda where you will actually need the best of economics, the best of minds to put their effort into. We recently at the World Bank had Guillermo Calvo, very prominent macroeconomist, uh, uh, interested in monetary um, economics and policy. Um, speaking and he was stressing actually the importance of this link and how we have to study this much better. Okay, uh, very interesting, however not totally r related to austerity. Um, yes, Mr. sorry, I gave that up. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Ballard, coming back to the austerity part, would you say that the difference between the uh, Euro Eurozone and the uh, US and, and where they're at at the economic level, I mean the US seems to be further at, um, does it have to do with the austerity being implemented in the Eurozone and maybe the Stimulus Act in 2009 in uh, the US where they promised more than uh, 800 billion over 10 years? How do you see, do you think that the US is further ahead because they've had more stimulus as opposed to the austerity measures being taken in the, in the Eurozone? Uh, well, this is a this is a great topic. Um, I think that in the U.S., uh, the response to the crisis was uh, very aggressive monetary policy. We we undertook uh, unconventional monetary policy sooner and in larger measure than it was here in Europe. And I think there's a very good reason for that. The ECB is a multilateral institution, and I. Frankly, I think the leaders at the ECB were not sure that they really had the mandate through the Maastricht Treaty yep. to go ahead and do these kinds of unconventional monetary policies. So that led to a protracted debate on whether the ECB should go ahead with unconventional policy or not. And eventually that has come out as they will. So they have uh, in the last year, but that much later than when the Fed did it. Uh, did so what you, got, what you got in Europe was a double dip recession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what you got in the US was a huge recession, but a, a, just a, a recovery from that big recession. So I think that's the fundamental difference. And I think there are, are good, uh, ex you know, good reasons uh, behind that. On the austerity question, in textbook models, when we do us, you know, government spending uh, in reaction to a crisis, we always start out with uh, the debt levels are zero, 
yeah. uh, or something like that. So the problem, I think, in Europe is that countries started with very high debt levels, Absolutely. and now the crisis came along, and now you had to go like even higher, and there are limits to how much of this you can do, as we found out, and you got, uh, you got countries that breached those limits and started to uh, call into question whether they could really pay back all this debt or not, and that led to the crisis okay. and the double dip. And I actually Mr. agree with that, that, and let me add in something Please. on austerity, which doesn't go into micro foundations, but just on that. You know, one of the very interesting things, if you look at the Eurozone, is in 1999, when the Euro comes into existence, yeah. there's a monetary union, something very strange happened across the Eurozone countries, borrowing money, when the, your Greece is borrowing money or Germany is borrowing money, from suddenly from 2001, Greece entered Eurozone a little bit later, from 2001, all of these countries are borrowing money at the same interest rates. Yeah. Before that, Greece would be borrowing at a much higher interest rate because people considered Greece to be riskier than Germany. Ireland would be borrowing at a higher, Portugal at a higher, Germany lower, France lower. By 2000, 2001, they are borrowing at the same interest rate. So the creation of the monetary union created a bit of an illusion that it's also a fiscal union. And all the way up to 2008, the interest rates at which they are borrowing is virtually the same. Yeah. 2008, Lehman crisis comes, and the borrowing cost again differs hugely. Greece shoots up, Germany goes down a little bit. What happened was, to my mind, the, this period from 2000 to 2008, there was over-borrowing in some countries, so that large debt that you're seeing by 2010 and 11 happened during this period. And my view is, yes, you don't want to have a sudden austerity and try to change that, but in the medium term, there has to be austerity because for this big debt buildup that has taken place, that needs to be corrected at some point. At some point so it has to be a nuanced policy, but we have to go into I that. I mean, at some point it has to be corrected, but for Greece, for example, in, in 2011, they had 110 uh, percent yeah. mm -hmm. uh, debt. Now it's 180. I mean, clearly austerity packages there have, have worsened the situation, and um, employment as well, shoot up. I mean, yeah. So, so it is the long run and the short run, so you have to correct for this period of over-borrowing that took place. But some of the initial enthusiasm that you yeah. bring it to a cold turkey is not right. It would damage these countries even bigger. But you have to have a medium-term plan when you're giving them greater space. Okay. Couldn't we also argue maybe for you, Mr. Ballard, um, we've seen austerity measures reduce um, confidence with the consumers. The main aim of the, of the Federal Reserve is to uh, lower the interest rate and to improve uh, spending by the consumers. Don't you think these are two strategies that might Counteract, counteract each, other. each other and not work towards I'm not sure I got the gist of this question, mm -hmm. but go ahead. So the, the Federal Reserve aims to reduce the interest rates to in increase confidence in government spending, and or uh, consumer, consumer spending, yeah. sorry. Okay. Or, um, and borrowing, borrowing yes. from the banks and spending yes. this money. Uh, the, um, sorry. Uh, the austerity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The austerity, I mean, if you, if you have austerity next to it, couldn't you say that those two, that austerity will reduce confidence at the lower income distribution and therefore that they won't actually borrow of the banks that now have more liquidity, resulting in possibly a liquidity trap? Um, well, uh, the idea behind lower interest rates is definitely to pull some of the consumption that's out there in the future, pull that to today. Exactly. Uh, it does mean you'll have less consumption in the future, but you'll smooth out, so it'll be better from a business cycle uh, perspective. Uh, the government spending, um, at least in normal times, should be the normal provision of uh, public goods and services and taxes that go along with that, and you want the government to make good decisions about exactly what they want, they're going to provide and what they're going to leave to the private sector. So I'm not sure I see, you know, I necessarily see uh, too much of a conflict here. All right. Um, maybe audience questions on austerity, um, please, for both gentlemen. No questions there, all right. Um, them from... Oh, he had a question. Oh, yeah. over here, yeah, please. Well, it's not, on, it's not on austerity, it's for President Bullard. So apparently, you know, we have a big research agenda at the University of the Bank of Economics on bounded rationality and heterogeneity and expectations. 
So going back to that point, uh, in our papers, I mean, in our models, we find that uh, bounded rationality in, in, uh, and uh, finite horizons can alter a lot uh, the way variables respond in, within the model, okay, taking also into account the infinite horizon models. Now, I know that, correct me if I'm wrong, the FRB US model, I think, accounts for uh, finite horizons, talking about effective planning horizons of individuals and the way they allocate their, uh, their wealth over time. But my question is, how willing are the policymakers nowadays to account for the effects of heterogeneity in expectations? Because what we find is that sometimes heterogeneity in expectations can make the work of monetary policy easier, okay. and some other times can make it tougher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, actually, the University of Amsterdam here has a great program in bounded rationality and macroeconomics. Uh, I'm partly affiliated with it. That's partly why I'm here. The conference is going on over the next couple of days. I would say the short answer to your question is that policymakers have a lot of sympathy for heterogeneous expectations and for backing off rational expectations. So when they talk, they talk a good game. <laughs> and then you actually go to the models and look at the actual models and look at what they're doing. Uh, it's not so much there. And I think that's because it's actually, ironically, it's actually pretty complicated to put all this stuff together and get your model to work and, and everything. So we're trying, uh, we've got our, you know, the group that's here over the next couple of days is working on exactly this and uh, I think we are making progress. So uh, right. uh, we're trying to get as far as we can on this. Okay, any other questions still? Yeah, over there and there, um, right at the back with the camera. I'd like to ask Mr. Basu on his op opinion on the measures the European Union took against Greece. Do you agree that the measures are more to safeguard the European banks that uh, had uh, given massive loans to Greece and Greece's problems to pay back its interests and so that rather the, bre the banks are safeguarded instead of Greece? Yeah, I, I think there is a disproportionate interest in that. However, I have to say that in that interest, there is a good part and a bad part. You do have to make sure that the banks do not collapse. So that is indeed a good thing because the ramifications of that can be very big. But it is driven primarily by that. And you can see that in other areas also. In the US, when the financial crisis started and there was the too big to fail idea. Yes, at one level you understand that if these big entities collapse, the ramification is going, through, going to go through the whole economy. But there is a danger on the other sa uh, side, is that if you know that once you're too big, the state will come in with taxpayer money to make sure that you cannot fail. It encourages bad behavior in the big and in the banks. So there is a plus side and a negative side, and it's a very, very fine balancing act. Yeah. And I'm sure that the primary motivation is indeed, as you say. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask a question about austerity again, bring it back there. Mm -hmm. Um, would you say that the austerity um, on like such a big continental scale for entire Eurozone um, couldn't we conclude that it has failed? I mean, looking at the numbers, looking at unemployment rates, looking at debt ratios actually increasing over this austerity time. Mr. Ballard, Mr. Basu, ha hasn't it failed austerity on this continental scale? You know, um, I, I don't think it's the austerity because at one level you have to tackle that and what is the other side of austerity you can't really have endless amount no. of injection but i'll tell you what is to my mind failing is i do believe that the negative interest rate policy is failing and the banks the central okay. banks are in a bit of a trap and no one can get out of it individually and very briefly the reason why to my mind it's failing is the typical belief is that when you lower interest rates People decide that it's not worth saving money. Consumption goes up, so by lowering interest rates, you boost consumption, it's not worth holding money. But what's happening now, when it goes very low interest rates, you begin to worry about your old age. And in fact, you begin to save more to make up for the fact that you won't earn interest rates. So that backfires on policy. Right. Far from boosting consumption, it does not do that. I do believe that we are getting into a bit of a negative interest rate trap which right. no se single central bank can pull out of, but we need some collective action. Okay, I would like a reaction on Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard, please. 
do you believe in this this trap in, in negative interest rates or low uh, interest rates? We do not have negative interest no, rates no, in no, the no, U.S. Yeah, not in the U.S. <laughs> everywhere else. But um, uh, I'll tell you what the St. Louis Fed is thinking. I don't speak for the Fed as a whole. Okay. Uh, what we're thinking is that the negative interest rates are more like a tax. They're a tax on the banks, and then the the banks have to. There, you know, when you talk about taxes, there's the incidence of the tax. Who's going to pay it? Uh, there are three people that can pay it. Uh, one would be the depositors. The depositors tend to really uh, resist getting negative uh, returns on their bank accounts. Uh, it could be the borrowers from the bank. Uh, they could have to pay a higher interest rate, or it could be on the profitability of the bank, uh, the investors in the bank. And but somebody has to pay the tax. And if you just talk about laying on a tax as a stimulative measure, it doesn't sound very stimulative when you talk about it that way. So that's what we're thinking right now uh, at the St. Louis Fed about negative interest rates. Uh, I don't think they're very likely in the U.S., uh, but they're uh, obviously Japan and Europe have gone in this direction. All right, but but on the on the point that Mr. Basu also made that people start to save more in order for their old day. I mean, uh, that a real I think that that's a very real. No, rates? I think that's a very real possibility, and I'll be okay. alert to more research on that. Uh, whether that's happening, uh, you certainly anecdotally. I talked to lots and lots of people, lots of different groups. They say exactly that. They say, well, you know, all, everyone is feeling like they can't get any rate of return on their saving. Therefore, they're having to uh, up the amount that they're putting right. into into their savings and account. Um, okay, then, then a final wrap-up. Um, could we maybe solve this with new models, shifting mm -hmm. towards new models? Could that be the savior of this maybe trap in savings? Could you see new models preventing this? Sometimes I tell people that we should ban the word stimulus. Mm -hmm. Get out of thinking about what's going to happen in the next quarter or the next six months or the, even the next year. Start thinking about what's going to happen over the next five to ten years. The World Bank is a great institution for this. You have to think about a longer-run growth agenda, both in the U.S. well and Japan and, and, and Europe, yeah. all of us. We've got to think about a longer-run growth agenda. What types of things are going to drive faster productivity growth above all? We seem to have all kinds of great new technology around. Uh, but when we look at the productivity numbers, they're not good. In the U.S., it's uh, right now about one half of one percent productivity growth per year. If we could get that number back up to uh, where it used to be, two percent or three percent, uh, you'd see fantastic things happening uh, for I think everybody in the economy. So, so I really think we need to focus on medium-term uh, growth. Mm -hmm. All right. And final word? Yeah. Ad actually, this morning with PricewaterhouseCoopers, the discussion that we had was on long-term uh, growth and long-term productivity. And I do believe that the short term is, of course, important. You have to attend to today. But at times, fighting fire at every moment means you don't spend enough research on non-flammable material, yeah. <laughs> which right. you do need. So you do have to pay attention to the long run, and maybe we are doing injustice to that. So we need some new models of that rather than just the immediate. Mm -hmm. I think on that note, it would be good to wrap up the interview. We've, uh, you've taught us a lot about uh, the, the development of the models and the interest rates and how we're going to get to more growth. Uh, thank you both for coming. Um, thanks for the, to the audience for coming to our opening uh, session of the year. Uh, next week's session will be on Thursday the 15th. It will be same place, same time. It will be on the circular economy together with um, Thomas, the, Rao. Yeah, Thomas Rao, sustainability expert. Can we have a warm applause Excellent. for our two guests? We've, uh, Great. Thank you. Thank you.